Ed, who would uh, normally have done this, Judy, in the past. We've had so many wonderful people that stepped up to the plate on your team, but you were the go-to guy, and I personally want to say thank you because you fielded so much that would have otherwise come to my desk and overwhelmed me. And what a pleasure it is to say, Marty, what am I doing? Okay, put me to work. And uh, it's, I, I love doing that. You were the man for the job. You stepped up big time. And so as a congregation, on three, we want to say, Marty, you rock. One, two, three. Marty, you rock. Oh, I guess I'm supposed to introduce our guest speaker for this morning, too, right? Um, <clears throat> Larry, Sue, it is so just incredible to have you guys here investing in us. Larry is part of the Foursquare National, National Church Office Pastoral Health Care Team, Church Health, all of that stuff. And I, I went to Colorado with him um, in March and really got to know you. We had such a great time together. And... Remember those surveys that we did, the chat survey, you know, where you fill out all those things and do that? So Larry is here helping us process as a church where we need to be better, what we, how we leverage our strengths, and to kind of get that outside opinion. And I really believe what was prayed by Sherry this morning in the prayer room, that you have a prophetic word for us. You've been prophesying to us. I have, I have so many notes and things in my, in my journal. But would you give uh, Larry Spousta a great warm Coastlands Community Church. Welcome to Chesapeake. Man, I wore one of them out already. This is this is not a good thing. Okay, you set. Thanks, boss. Well, it's been a joy to be with your leadership team for, as I said, uh, for the last uh, number of hours, and we've had an opportunity to look at your chat survey, which stands for Church Health Assessment Tool. And sometimes you say, like, uh, assessing our church, what, what's that really all about? And basically what we're doing is we're trying to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to listen to you as the congregation of how things are going. And I want to commend uh, Pastor Durant just for taking that step. A lot of times pastors have a tendency to say, hey, I'm hearing God. Uh, people, you're supposed to follow me. I don't really want to, I, I don't need your opinions. I don't want your opinions. I'm just going to go down. As long as I please God, I'm fine. And your pastor has not taken that step. He wants to hear what you have to say. Your pastoral staff has, has taken the step to just say, we want to know. We want to be aware of, of this. Matter of fact, Proverbs says to be, be diligent to know the state of your flock. And, and to, to be tuned in and listen. Because blessing doesn't last from generation to generation. Just because it happened in the past doesn't mean it will in the present and the future. And you're taking steps as a congregation to see that developed in your midst. I do want you to know that your church, from uh, anything that the survey has spoken, is alive and well and healthy. 
It's healthy. It is. It's, it's, it's healthy. The strongest areas of, of, that you affirmed was the empowering presence of God when you came together. And when you went out in the community. That was the number one thing you as a congregation said. We, we sense the empowering presence of God on our lives and when, when we gather and when we scatter. That's powerful. The second was your fellowship was a contagious New Testament fellowship where people are built up and strengthened and Jesus is lifted up in your midst. And those are the two top things that you as the congregation affirmed about your church. And I, I think that's stellar. I, I think that's wonderful. As I travel around and my wife, uh, Sue, matter of fact, Sue, why don't you stand up? They, they appreciate me more when they see her, you know. Uh, in uh, about three weeks, two weeks, three weeks, we'll be celebrating 45 years of being married. I want you to know she's quite a chick for 45 years of marriage. Uh, I really appreciate just the... The blessing we have to serve together is, as Pastor Durant said, we serve our, our larger national family of four square around the United States. I function as the leadership health coordinator, which helps, which my, my assignment is to help pastors stay healthy. And uh, serve in any way I can to come alongside them because pastors have a tendency to be uh, uh, so committed to kingdom values and uh, kingdom extension that we, we we many times get caught up in, in the Lord of the harvest and we don't understand that he's also the Lord of the Sabbath. He calls us to rest. And I want to talk today and I don't I don't know if, uh, how much I want to preach as much as I just want to talk at you for a while, talk with you for a while. And uh, I ask you to Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We've been talking in the leadership team for the last couple of days just about what this this whole thing is, the, the, the church health assessment tool and, and all, all that that's, that's taking place in that. And I, I started just musing to myself, you know, what would happen if, if we saw when people respond to Jesus Christ as that being the launching pad of a lifetime quest of individually, completely selling out to Jesus Christ. I'm in a lot of gatherings where there's, where there's an opportunity for people to receive Jesus. And I don't minimize it, but many times it's okay, how many of you want to receive the Lord and hands go up or nod at me or there's a few responses. But, but I'm, I'm wondering how much people really understand that they're stepping into a whole new realm of life. A transformation. Not, not coming into, and I don't, I don't want to say this in a negative way, but not coming into the, the congregation as almost a new club member. And uh, now learn how the rules work so you can conform to the club, but how Jesus Christ comes into our life and transforms us and makes us brand new. And I want you to know in the world we're living in today, we need a transformed life. Trying to play by the rules is not good enough. We need a transformed life in Jesus Christ. And, and, I, and we talked uh, over the weekend, we, we've been talking with your leaders, not so much about the church, but how do we, how do you as a congregation continue to create a culture, a culture of Christ, a culture of Christ's kingdom, because even in the Lord's Prayer, he said his desire is that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. And I, I want you to know that isn't lofty talk. That isn't lofty Bible talk. That's God's intention. And I, know, I want you to know not only is it his intention, it's his promise and his will will be done. It will happen. His kingdom will come on this earth as it is in heaven. And we get to be a part of ushering that in now. We live in a time where the kingdom is now and not yet. 
His kingdom is now because we are the people. He said, my kingdom is in you. We take the kingdom in the world around us. And yet when he comes back and establishes his rule and reign, his kingdom will truly be consummated. It will come on earth as it is in heaven. Between now and then, though, how do we, what I would call, develop a kingdom culture in our midst? How do we do that? Well, as I said, what would it look like if, as every one of us as individual followers of Jesus Christ, completely sold out to Him, emotionally, physically, intellectually, vocationally, sold out to Jesus Christ, to the Son of God, and lived out the life of Jesus completely. Where worship became an everyday lifestyle and not just a a sanctuary event. Where belief became more than knowledge, but would be something to transform us from the inside out. Where submission to the Holy Spirit was expressed in decision making of every believer every day of their life. Where hearts became sensitive to how sin offended God and limited their own personal potential. Not, whoops, I got caught. But how does this break the heart of God? Where believers would joyfully share their lives and their resources with one another. Where Christ followers would engage in lifestyle evangelism. What would that look like? Where disciples of Christ would live differently than the world around them. People would know that we're believers by our love and our care and our commitment and our non-compromise. Individuals would be continually linked to God through prayer and meditation. They would constantly walk in relationship with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And believers would steward their gifts and skills in serving the church and their community in faithfulness. What would, look like, what would the church look like? What would that kind of kingdom community look like? A well-known author, his name is Neil Cole. He's the director of Church Multiplication Association, said this. He said, we need to lower the bar of how church is done and raise the bar of what it means to be a disciple. Let me read that again. We need to lower the bar of how church is done and all the, the things that are nice and important, but lower that bar and raise the bar of what it means to be a disciple. We seem to make church too complex and discipleship too easy. We seem to make church too complex and discipleship too easy. And I want you to know that that's in taking the survey, the chat survey, we're not trying to say, how do we do church better? But how do we walk out the life of Jesus on a daily basis, fully sold out to Him? That's what this is all about. It's how do we do life together better? And uh, as we look at that, I, I, I see that there's... There's, we, ha- we have to come to the place that we understand that discipleship is not just a starting point for all believers, but it's the abiding practice of all believers. It's the key to a life of impact and growth and dynamic. See, the, the, the challenge of discipleship in our, in, our, in our world today is the busyness and distraction of the Western culture. There's just too many things pulling at us at all the time. All the time, and I, I think also an inadequate commitment to dis, the discipleship journey. It's a fresh new call that God is calling to His church to say, "I w- don't want you to conform to the world around you, and I want you to freshly commit yourself to Jesus Christ, wholly and totally." Both areas are necessary for impact. 
Uh, the reason I had you turn to Matthew chapter 5, and in matter of fact, I'll even jo- jump up a little before that, is it's Jesus is starting into his ministry and the crowds are beginning to follow him. In Matthew chapter 4, uh, it talks about him coming into Galilee and his teaching and preaching and proclaiming the kingdom. And a uh, matter of fact, let me read there and then I'll come to, to chapter 5 and read the, the first couple of verses and then we'll jump in. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogue, pre- proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease, sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee and Decapolis, Jerusalem and Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. I'll stop there. From that point on, we move in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It starts with the Beatitudes, the blessed are. And what he does is he lays out a way of living, what, what I would call a kingdom culture, to the followers of Jesus Christ. This is what it means to, to totally live out the life of God in His kingdom. And He came and He started with the Beatitudes and and, and laid out that foundation. Then He goes on to talk to them about their identity. You are the salt of the earth. Don't lose your savor. You're the light on a hill. Make sure you shine forth. And He breaks into talking about His purpose. I didn't come to, to over the law, but I came to fulfill it. Moses brought the commandments, and I brought the way of life. Moses was more of the, the rules, and he says, I'll teach you how to live. And he, he moves for the next of chapter 6, where he talks about, you've heard it said, but now let me share with you the fulfillment of that. And it's, it, it's so amazing because it, he broke away from the religious tradition of that time, from what, they would, what we would call probably doing church to doing life. They had all the rules figured out. They had all the things nailed down. And Jesus stepped out of that box. And he showed, now this is how life is to be lived. And then we jump in, he goes on to talk about the area of, of their practices. He says, this is how you practice. It isn't just about fasting, it's how you fast too. Don't, don't fast for everybody to see you. Don't pray for everybody to watch. Don't do all those, those things for the public eye. And he just lays out a pathway in the Sermon of Mount of a different way of living, a different way of serving. And then he talks about the prohibitions. Don't worry. Don't judge others. And he shares about God's heart. God's heart is to want to give to you. Ask. Seek. Knock. And he shares a different way. He lays out a different pathway. And then he comes to the close of the Sermon on the Mount. And he, he finishes out with what I call the, the closing instruction and warning. And I, the closing, he finished his whole teaching on the kingdom, and then he basically came to the place where he said, and let me finish with this. And I'm going to read from uh, now verse, let me look here, from verse 13 of uh, chapter 7, down to the end of the Sermon on the Mount there at the end of the chapter. I'm not going to comment, and then I'll come, I'll come back and we'll make some applications. But I, I, I want us to pray before we do that and ask the Holy Spirit to really direct and guide the conversations. You know, there'll be a lot of things that I say that you may forget, but they're things that the Holy Spirit will reveal. 
that you'll never forget, and they'll be transformational. And those are the things you want to be listening for. And may, they, they may not even come out of my mouth. They'll be communicated to you by the Spirit. But let's invite His Holy Spirit to teach us and guide us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you proceeded to us, each one of us to this place in our life. You laid out a plan for us, a plan for good, for a future, and for hope. And Lord, this is, this is not just another day. It's a day that you've made. And you have a purpose for it. And we invite your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts this morning. Convict us of the areas we fall short. And, and Lord Jesus, convince us that you love us totally, completely, unconditionally. And that nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for this congregation. I pray you'd give us all ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. We open to your word. We open to the transforming work of, of your Spirit in us. In Jesus' name, amen. He's finishing up now the the parable. And you have to see that Jesus is sitting with his disciples on the mount. He's been training them, teaching them about the kingdom. This is the life I've called to you. And this has stretched them outside their comfort zone. When I read through the Sermon on the Mount, it stretches me. It just stretches me outside my comfort zone because I realize as I read, read through it, I can't do this. I've, given me, I've been given an instruction manual that I can't do. And it calls me to a certain humility and brokenness of spirit. And the Lord said, and blessed are the poor in spirit. It calls me to mourn over my shortcomings and sin. And he says, and as you mourn, I'll bring you comfort. And you begin to move into a relationship with the Holy Spirit. As the disciples said, and now as he brought, draws it to a close, he says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you as sheep in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are fear, ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from a thistle? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had been built on the foundation of the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who practices who builds his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. There's four things that are said there in each of these little stories, and, and I want to just capsulize them as we say, Lord, we want to be people who develop a kingdom culture, who walk out a kingdom of culture. See, we talked about a healthy church, but a healthy church is made up of healthy people. Healthy disciples. Matter of fact, the word disciple actually means apprentice. 
healthy apprentices of Jesus Christ. And he starts out, first of all, with the question, he said, what path will you walk? Every one of us have a choice to be made. You say, well, I made that choice, I'm following Jesus Christ. Now, it's it's bigger than that. It's a kingdom life he's calling us, us to. What path will you walk? It's important that we establish at the onset a goal that helps us determine our direction. Sometimes we come to Jesus Christ and say, well, I'm kind of journeying with the Lord and I hope he gets me where where I'm supposed to go. You know, I, I hope he gets me where I'm supposed to go. But it's setting a direction in your life. What path will you go? See that and he and he says there's two two paths. There's the narrow gate and there's the wide gate. There's the narrow gate, and sometimes we have a tendency to say, well, I'm not, I'm not into the narrow gate because it, it seems restrictive. And I think our culture, and even in the church, we have a tendency to, to say, well, I kind of like a life without boundaries, without restrictions. It's kind of part of the Western way. We're free people. I like to be free. I, I, I like to make my own decisions. I like to... To go where I want and do what I want and when I want and how I want and that's not necessarily what God had in mind when He saved you. See, true freedom does not only provide freedom from, but it provides freedom to as well. See, the problem is if you live a life without boundaries, you also live a life without protection. More and more we come to understand that as the years go by. I want to be free. I want to be free. And all of a sudden, free from responsibility, free from this, free from having to save now so later on I can... And then you, the older you get, the more you understand God's kingdom principle is, is very important. You pay, You invest now. You... You, you lay down your life now that you might experience His fullness in, in our life. See, what He's really talking about here is this important part of our life of, of choosing the narrow way. About not getting caught up with the crowd of our culture. Matter of fact, when it talks about the narrow way, it's kind of talking about a path that can only be walked single file. It's a single file path. In general, our culture has a tendency to go by crowd. We're moved by the crowd. What's everybody else doing? I'll jump in and do it with them. And and the following of Jesus Christ comes on a single file walk. I follow him. I follow him. Robert Frost uh, wrote a poem, The Road Not Taken. And the last sentence in the poem says this, Two roads diverged in the woods, and I, I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. Even in the Christian community, there's a, there's a road that's very strongly traveled. There's the crowds go on it. It's what I call kind of contemporary popular Christianity. It, it, it's made to draw the crowds. I don't criticize that. I just observe. But Jesus had the tendency to thin out the crowd. Did you notice that? Here the crowds had gathered. He went up. He spoke this. And, and all of a sudden the crowds thin out. Because what he was looking for is not crowds, but he's looking for disciples, followers, apprentices who would walk out his way. A life that has no boundaries, has no protections. A life that's free from restrictions is not very fulfilling. The road less traveled is is important. And many times you say, well, how does this work? Look in the life of Moses in, in, in Exodus chapter 3. Moses, it goes in Exodus chapter 3. Moses is faithfully 
caring for the flock in the backside of the Sinai desert, desert. He's doing what he's supposed to do. He's being a shepherd. He's faithfully serving. And in the midst of that, God called him from the path. I think if I have a maybe a, a, a word of encouragement and maybe even a word of, with a little prophetic nature, some of you have been walking a path of faithfulness for a long time. You're a very experienced believer. You walk in Jesus over a season of time. You say, I, I, I love Jesus and everything. But the Lord would draw your attention to a burning bush. A, low, a road less traveled. A step off the path. Because He has more for you. For, more for you personally, more for you as a family, more for you as a congregational family. He has more for you. And Moses went and he encountered God. I love it. It's almost like God was watching his response, it says, because as Moses, Moses stepped off the path and God took note of it. He saw him make that move. God's watching our life and he knows when we are called off the path. It's about, in my own personal life, about four years ago, I was, I'd been walking with the Lord, uh, it's going to come on about 50 years here pretty soon. Came to know the Lord as a young teenager. I've been uh, trying to faithfully read my Bible. I mean, when I got saved, I didn't even know what a Bible was. And so I just took this holy book and I stuck it and I had a some of you wouldn't remember it probably shows my I had a bookcase bed it had two little shelves on each side and I had my living bible and it was the one I think it was called good news for modern man and had the little pictures in it and I would read it by paragraph because I thought that's how it worked and every night I'd read a paragraph and I'd, I'd faithfully, over the years that's grown, I, I've done as probably your pastor taught you, how to do scripture, observation, application, uh, prayer. I, you call it soaping. I'd find after 50 years of just personal walk, prayer, soaping, my soaping had lost its lather. I did it faithfully. I prayed. I, I did all the things. I'm, matter of fact, I doubled my efforts in some areas, but I really was not experiencing the deep, deep encounter and not seeing the hunger in my life that I had for Jesus. Filled in. I had, there wasn't any apparent sin. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, involved in anything on the side. I wasn't viewing pornography at night. I wasn't doing anything. I was just trying to pursue Jesus and... I had a person that challenged me to do something. He said, I'm going to challenge you to do something. You won't do it, but I'm going to challenge you to do it. But you probably won't do it, but I'm going to challenge you. And if you do, it will change your life, but you won't do it. And, and I, I grew up in Nebraska. I'm a farm boy. You tell me I can't do it, I'm going to do it. You know. So I just said, well, tell me what you want. You know, what, What's going to change my life? And he says, I'm going to challenge you to spend 20 minutes with God in silence and solitude every morning. I said, oh, I can do that. I think he's going to ask me something really big, you know. Uh, and I said, I can do that. He said, but you can't pray. I said, I can't pray. He said, no, you just sit with God. Sit with God. Okay, I can do this. I go home the next day and I go into my place, kind of in the, my study area, and I early in the morning, I'm early riser, I sit down on the floor because I don't want to fall asleep. I'm going to, uh, in, my, in my nice cozy uh, chair, I sit down on the floor, kind of cross my legs. Some person would think I'm trying to do yoga, but I was just trying to sit in a tension posture, took out my iPhone, set it for 20 minutes, put it on the floor, and I said, okay, we're gone here, and I'm going to do this. And I moved into my time of waiting with God, you know. And man, I, I'm sure 40 minutes had gone by and the iPhone forgot to... And I looked down and 10 minutes had gone by. I go, oh my gosh. 
Any of you know what, it, what it's like to have your mind like a monkey in the trees gathering bananas? That's what my mind was. I mean, it was everywhere but God. It was, you know, you had to change the oil on your car. Yeah, you know, and all these things are jumping into my mind. And I'm, no, I'm supposed to... And I'll tell you, it was the toughest 20 minutes I'd ever done. Finally got to the end, I said, well, tomorrow will be better. T- tomorrow was worse. <laughs> By the end of the week, I felt totally defeated. I felt like such a crummy Christian. I can't even spend 20 minutes with God without talking. And finally at the end of the week, I went in frustration. Any of you ever get frustrated with God or is it only me? I, I was frustrated. I said, God, I'm not Catholic and I'm not a monk and it doesn't work for me. That's it. I, it it's not working for me. And everything got quiet. You always, I always get concerned when God goes quiet on you. And everything got quiet. And then he spoke and he said, Really, it's working for me just fine. And it started me on a transformational journey of being called off the path. And those 20 minutes were the best time of my day. Because it's a time when he loves me with no conditions. I'm there, and he's there, and we sit together, and he changes me. You say, how does he change you? I don't know. I'm just different than I was four years ago because I sat with the God of the universe. That shouldn't surprise me. shouldn't surprise any of us. But it's, what path will you walk it's a, it's a narrowing path. There's boundaries. There's disciplines God calls us to on the narrowing path. But it's a, it's a life that is so fantastic. His kingdom comes and, and I'm sitting in my quiet place with the God of the universe who sees me inside and out and knows my every thought and my every dream and aspiration and put... put them in there and now wants to fulfill them. I'm with him and he loves me even in my naked sinfulness because he sees it all. And he says, I am totally delighted with you. you. You just make my day, Larry. And he says the exact same thing to you if you're his son. God, God is just gleeful. He's giddy about how much he loves you. Can you absorb that? It's hard. Because I live with me. And my wife lives with me. (laughs) But God dwells within me. And you. And he loves us so much. But you've got to choose the narrow way. I shouldn't say you've got to. You get to choose the narrow way. Number two. What fruit will you bear? It's about abiding. See, ongoing fruitfulness is only accomplished through abiding and pruning. Abiding is an interesting thing because what this really talks about is character reproduction, character development, the character of Christ in us, Christ-likeness. Fruit comes from abiding, that striving. You can't go into an apple orchard and hear the trees grunting to produce. They just abide. The roots are down, the nourishment comes, they remain, and out comes the fruit. Fruitfulness comes from abiding. You say, well, that's no revelation. It is when you understand really what kind of fruit you want to produce. Because most of the time we have a tendency to say, if I just pray more, if I just try harder, if I just serve more. Matter of fact, I'm having a bad day today, so I'm going to serve somebody. Because that will make me feel better about myself. 
may make you feel better about yourself, but I'm not sure it will produce any more fruit in your life. See, character comes from abiding. You remain in Him. You say, Pastor Larry, you make it sound so simple. It really is simple, it's just not easy. God makes the things of the Scripture, the life of Jesus, the culture of the kingdom is not meant to be difficult to understand. It's meant to be impossible to live without the power of God in your life, without relationship with God in your life on a consistent basis. What fruit will you bear? Have you ever... uh, The other day, uh, my wife had got some some apples at our local Costco and there's only two of us and we have a tendency because you go to Costco and they're cheaper you get the big bag, the 10 pound bag they're cheaper, you know by the end of the bag they, it, we had some in a bowl and in, in the middle of our counter and I went to grab one and it looked so nice on the outside and they grabbed it on the back side it was rotten you just go, oh yeah waited too long should have ate that one a week ago and see, there's, a, there's this thing. What fruit will you bear? Will we be people who have this appearance? Or will we have the substance? When people take a bite of, out of your life, maybe that's a good way to explain it too. When take, people take a bite out of your life, what do you taste like? You say, well, I'd like it better if they squeeze me. Most of the time they don't squeeze you, they bite you. That's when you really find out what kind of fruit's in your life, right? Why don't they just hug me, you know? The time you find out what fruit is in your life is when you get bit. And then you really understand, is there fruitfulness in my character? Is there fruitfulness in my life? Or do I just have the appearance till somebody steps on my toes? You know, my my character lasts about as far as to the end of my nose. If your fist touches my nose, I got we got problems. And you come to the place where you say, No, no, I the character of Jesus Christ in me, even if you take a bite out of my life, the character of Jesus Christ will be what you taste. And you say, Well, how does that work? Well, I, I, I'm not exactly sure. I do know that when, when He is the vine and we are the branches, the, the vitality of the life of Jesus flows through us and produces fruit. But I also know there's a constant pruning, a constant maintaining. Uh, for 20 years, my wife and I had the opportunity to pastor a church in Salem, Oregon, which is the capital city of Oregon. And we went there and planted this church in... Uh, we grew with the church, or the church grew us. But I remember as we came into the city on the other side of the river in West Salem, there was these gigantic walnut groves, just mile I shouldn't say miles, acres of walnut trees. And the thing that was so striking about it, these acres of walnut trees were dead. It was just like a skeleton. It was like a boneyard of walnut trees. And... I'd driven past them a few times. I asked one of the guys in our church, I said, what happened? What, you know, what happened to these trees? He said, well, that's an interesting story. He said, years ago, this part of the Willamette Valley, uh, the conditions were right, and they brought in a, a special walnut tree, and they grafted it with another walnut tree that was to be disease-resistant. And in... And, and they grafted it, and they, they said, for 20 years, this part of the, of the Willamette Valley was the major walnut producer in the United States. I mean, it was, and then the trees started dying out from the top. And they brought in the agriculturists, and they said, what kind of blight is, uh, took place here? Is there some insect that's got, and they found out that where the graft had taken place, they didn't cleanse the tools. And a bacteria had got in it. It took 20 years. But 20 years because they didn't deal with cleansing. 20 years later, the trees died out and the orchards were dead and they became great firewood. And it really speaks to us how you say, hey, I'm green, I'm produced. 
with the Holy Spirit, that's, again, the waiting time where He can go down deep. Make sure if there's any bacteria in there, it's cleansed out. Does that make sense to you? Important that we stay on that on constant journey. The third thing, what, what Lord will you follow? They say, well, I, I follow Jesus Christ as Lord. It's t- talking about obedience. Lordship involves our personal lifestyle decisions. Here in this this place, it, 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 it's talking about the people who say, Lord, didn't I prophesy? Didn't I do this for you? And I did that for you? And I did that for you? And he said, depart from me. I, I, I really never knew you. And the word knew there is a really interesting word in the Greek. It, it's, it's talking about not so much that he didn't know them, but he didn't approve what they were doing. They weren't doing good things. They just weren't the God things. They weren't the things that He called them to do. It's amazing how much of our Christian life can get caught up in the good things and we miss the God things. Things that He wants to do in and through us. What Lord will you follow? So important as we enter in that part of our journey. See, lordship involves surrender. For a long time I thought lordship involved obedience. I want you to know you can obey God and not surrender to Him, but you can't surrender to God and not obey Him. Let me say that again. You can obey God, say, Lord, I'll... I'll I'll obey you. But deep down inside, there's still this personal ownership of your life. You know, I'll do what you say, but my life's still my own. But when you surrender, it's like, I say yes before he even asks. We say yes, Lord, whatever. We sign the check, you fill in the amount. It doesn't matter. And that's this whole thing of, of, of lordship. It's a surrender, it's a submission to Jesus Christ that ekes into every part of our lives. How we we walk and how we talk and how we love our kids and how we love our neighbors and, 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 and how we do life and how we love the things around us, how we steward the planet He's given us stewardship over, how we live out His kingdom to come on this earth. See, and then the last one. What foundation will you build upon? See, it's talking about a lasting legacy. See, like, lasting legacy is produced, is the product of living a life of obedience to God's word and his spirit. Surrendering to Jesus Christ. What legacy will you leave? Every man and woman builds. To this point in your life, you've been building something. Every man and woman builds. Whether you're young, or you're halfway through, or you're kind of like me, three quarters of the way, uh, maybe the last third. Every man and woman builds. And I don't think there's so much a difference between uh, the uh, individual's building skills. I don't think that's that has... Not even necessarily the materials, though the scripture says there's wood, hay, and stubble. I don't, I don't think it's even the materials. But it's the foundation we build upon. It's the foundation you build upon. And Jesus is now bringing his disciples. He's instructing me. He says... You know, what path are you going to walk? Are you going to take the narrow one? Are you going to kind of go with the least resistance and stick with the crowd? Nobody will notice. Most of the time they don't. What fruit will you bear? Until someone takes a bite out of you, you look good anyhow. What Lord will you follow? Uh, are, are you a 
person of obedience or are you a person who surrenders? Jesus, whatever. Whatever you have for me. And what foundation? The scripture talks about there's only one foundation that will last. And we're living in a place where everything, Hebrew says it, will come a day where everything that can get shaken will be shaken. How many do you even believe we're in that time in our culture today? Only three of you are convinced of that. Have you watched the news? Do you live on the same planet I do? It's, it's a day where everything that can be shaken is being shaken. Can I encourage you? Only the things that aren't built on Jesus can fall down. And the things that are built on Jesus can't fall down. Here's the decision. Are you going to cry about what fell down or are you going to build on what stands? The foundation. Jesus Christ. Anything else is sinking sand in it. I love what it says here. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the foolish man who builds a house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house, and its falling was great. So it's good. And you might say, wow, Pastor Larry, this is kind of a heavy message. No, it's a wonderful invitation. How do you want to live? You can probably, I'm not even saying this, is, this decides whether you get into heaven or not. It just decides whether heaven's going to get into you or not. And through you into the world around you. That's the decision being made. If all you're looking for is make heaven, then probably delete this teaching. Just take those couple chapters out of the Bible. Because they're not necessary. But if you really want the life of God and experience the kingdom in you, and if you want to find walk the road less traveled, and I found even in my own, I love to hike, and some of the times I find the best stuff on, on the hiking paths that are less traveled. The surprise waterfall. The, the, I, the two bucks crossing the river in front of you. You wouldn't have found that if you'd stayed to the normal path. The beauty of walking with Jesus. The surprises He lives, leaves along the way. His goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our life. I want you to know God loves you. His no conditions love. You say, well, I'm here this morning and I don't know Jesus. Can I tell you something? <laughs> he loves you now as much as He ever will. God will never love you more than He does this moment. The only thing you have the opportunity to do is respond to His love. and surrender your life to Him. Choose the narrow way. It's a great path. It's a great path. Bear fruit that lasts. That your children call you blessed. That your community say, man, that's a blessed house. That's a, that's a church that's a blessed place. Continue to give yourself to a surrender that brings about any obedience that God has for you. And build on the, un uh, on the foundation that will be never shaken down. Build on that. Because then you don't have to remodel. You just... God, and it saves time. Don't waste time... Matter of fact, invite God to shake, your, shake you on a consistent basis. Who wants to waste time building on something that's going to fall down anyhow? I hope you sense the invitation of the Spirit of Jesus Christ to you. You're a good church. But God has more for you. Would you bow your head?
for a moment. Lord, thank you for every life. And I, I say that individually. Every person that sits in this room individually, you know their name. You, you gave them a unique fin, fingerprint. You know every hair on their head. You know everything about them. And you say to them, I love you with no conditions. And I will always love you. And I have such an amazing plan for your life if you'll just surrender to me. If you're here this morning and you've never made that step of surrender to Jesus Christ and you want to take that step. And I said that today, when you make, when you make that step, it's just the launching pad. You just started the journey. But you're in a good place to start it. <laughs> You've got good shepherds around you to care for you. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful healthy place to start your life with Jesus. But if you today, whether you're young, as I said, I was a young teenager when I made my commitment to Jesus. Wish I'd have started earlier. If you're young or old, you say, it's too late for me. No, 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 no. You don't understand. God is the only one who can restore the years that were lost. He promises that. Years that were wasted. Or you just may say, I am so empty and lonely. I just want to belong. Jesus wants to tell you, you do belong to him. If you're here this morning, you say, I want to surrender to Jesus Christ. I want to give him all all of me, which involves your sin as well. He'll take that. And he'll forgive you because he paid the price. If you want to make that step this morning, would you just raise your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. I just want to raise uh, raise my hand up and say, Lord, today I mean business. Some of you young people, it's a great time to start your life with Jesus. Anyone give that opportunity? I'm glad somebody gave it to me. I'm looking around. Nobody else is. Just me. Yes. Those hands up. Second of all, you've known Jesus for maybe a season of time, but you say, my road probably hasn't been as narrow as it needs to be. My uh, attentions have been distracted, and today I want to surrender. I don't, I don't want to just obey the rules. I want to experience the life, and that comes through surrender. And you say, that's me. I want to surrender everything to Jesus. The hands are coming up already. Just raise your hands. I want, I want God to have it all. I, I want to bear fruit that lasts. I want, I want my life to make a difference. I want to build on a foundation that can't be shaken down. So many hands coming up. Jesus sees every one of them and he sees the heart behind the hands. Now I want Pastor Durant to come and pray for you. Your shepherd, a faithful shepherd, and speak just over you the blessing of the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Larry. You know, when we surrender, it's not just for us. But when we are surrendered, we live a life wherever we go that models the kingdom of heaven. I'd like you to stand with me as we prepare to go into the mission field of life. 100% surrendered, completely committed. Followers of Jesus Christ. Father, I, I bless 
this family, the people of this house, we have heard the word of the Lord. We have received the word of the Lord. Now would you produce fruit that would last 30, 60, and 100 fold wherever we go. That the light and the life of Jesus would thrive in our communities, in our families, in our workplaces, in the highways and byways. Because you, the King of Heaven, would advance your kingdom through us, your family, your kids. And I release you with this, church, as we go. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of by the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit. You got this, church, because the Spirit is in you. Go in His peace. Let's be His hands and His feet. God bless you.